Any more people that yeah. have less hair. So thank so you we, for uh, that. We operate a fund of funds. We're based out of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, we specialize specifically in, in apartments. I, I appreciate those comments. Um, my name is Lauren Hanna. I'm head of investor relations at Holdfolio, and I don't know how much my introduction is going to be helpful because Jacob, he kind of, uh, you know, kicked off a bit of the, the story of Holdfolio this morning. Um, but just to recap, uh, we're also a fund of funds. We've had a really great transition in uh, the space over the last 10 years, but primarily focused on multifamily investments around the U.S. We're pretty opportunistic, but we can get more into that later. Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Alex uh, Kolodinko, originally from Ukraine, currently live in Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm a co-founder of uh, Wealthy Mind Investments. Uh, we are fund managers and we've done 17 uh, deals over the last three years, raised about 50 million. Uh, it's been a booming, booming <laughs> last three years together my, with my business partner who is here. We started multifamily and uh, we pivoted uh, and expanded our footprint uh, into other asset classes such as uh, healthcare, real estate, ATM funds. We're also looking into industrial and storage. And uh, if if a guy from Ukraine is able to raise so much money, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Carlos Nunez uh, with Sage Rock, currently launching a fund of funds. Um, primarily focused in ground up development and multifamily, but we're open to other opportunities as well. Christian Sadler, VP of Investor Relations with pre iShare, and we're launching a secondary marketplace for fractional shares of syndications. And we just launched a $100 million fund so that we can buy those and give instant liquidity to your investors. And on top of that, we will also do pref equity at critical times. Awesome. So we're going to go down the line again with what we know about the economy right now. Nope, it's starting with you. Don't. <laughs> um, what we know is happening in the economy right now. Why have you chosen this fund to fund model? And I know your answer is going to be a little bit different, but go ahead. Why are you opportunistic about investing with funds right now or the secondary market? Yeah, so the, the reason that we chose the fund of funds is really the mission behind what we're doing of aligning the interests of the passive investor and the syndicator, the sponsor. And so our CEO, over 40 years, did over $7 billion in real estate syndications. He retired from that and realized that he didn't want to be retired. And so he decided to start creating his legacy for this industry, so to speak. And I'm just lucky enough that I get to uh, ride his coattails and be along for it. So again, why have, have you chosen the fund and fund model in, given the light of what's happening in the economy? We're going the fund and fund model route because Doing it that way, it's really fun to work with individuals like yourselves who are passionate about real estate and going out there and helping find professionals like yourselves who are really looking to amplify what they're doing. So we're able to look at different opportunities, different markets, and that's just kind of the niche we want to be in. So yeah. So we chose fund of fund model for a couple of reasons. I think there is one thing that uh, you have to keep in mind, which is asking what investors want and also being able to ask yourself, is that something that you can deliver? So in our case, we didn't want to be operators, even though we wanted to explore that as an option, but after a while we ruled it out and then we said, what's next? And then being in Silicon Valley, we have a lot of access to accredited investors. So we decided that's the value add that we bring to experienced sponsors that are periodically short on capital. And even the best sponsors are out there, especially now, they're struggling with raising capital. So that's the value add that we bring and we just find the top-notch operators uh, after a very thorough due diligence, which we'll probably talk about later. Thank you. Yeah, so it was mentioned a little bit earlier today by Jacob, but we started off as sponsors, so we were very you know, boots on the ground, working on uh, these different properties all around the country, and I'm sure that many of you can attest to the, you know, the, the hard work that comes with that, um, the detail and the, uh, the amount of focus that comes with, with being a sponsor. 
Um, and we did that for many years and then shifted over to this fund of funds approach. Um, like Jacob mentioned, you know, to kind of focus on sponsor cloud, but also to be able to get into bigger deals. It significantly expanded the opportunity that Holdfolio had to tap into these amazing markets, these amazing returns all around the United States. Um, and so for our business, it significantly increased the return to investors, um, significantly reduced the risk that we were running as a team, and just has been a phenomenal shift in strategy. And yeah, there, there's no turning back. Um, I think a big part for us was just recognizing where our strengths lie. And, uh, and looking at what we've done over the years, we've owned properties, we've done smaller projects, we've done deal-specific syndications, seeing what was happening in the marketplace and what was, what was changing, we decided, we were trying to do all of it. And it, was just, it was just a little too much. And so we decided to take a step back and we looked at, hey, what, what are the operators, what, if, what are one of their biggest pain points? And it's raising capital because these operators, they do a hell of a job at finding these deals, sourcing them, and closing them, and then operating them. They get a deal under contract, 45, 60 days later, they need to come up with 10, 20 million dollars. And some of them that have been around for a while can do that. And then we've also looked at the investors. And there's investors getting into deals that they probably shouldn't be getting into because they don't have the education and the sophistication to know how they're getting into these deals. So. Our strengths is connecting with people and we love educating. So we took a step back and we've really decided to bridge that gap between the investor and the operator. So everything we do is geared around the fund to fund model. And to be honest, we, we all know what the hot markets are for investing in these Sunbelt states. If I were to go in and try to compete with an operator that's been established there for 10 years, good luck trying to get any of those pocket listings from brokers. So why would I go in and compete with that operator when I know they need capital? Let's collaborate with them. I know money that they don't know. So why not work around building that, that community around capital and then partnering with some of the top performing operators? So it just made sense. It made sense for, for who we were and, and really what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you guys have definitely talked about the main criteria. So you're mitigating risk. It's staying in your zone of genius it's easier for your team and you're you have the capital you have the additional relationships so you're bringing value to people that you're choosing to partner with um since we're in a room full of sponsors and managing partners um and you guys hold all of the cards since you show us fund of funds tell us what are the types of deals what's your investment criteria where do you set the bar what do you rule out um, what are some red flags? Just tell us everything. Are we talking deal, deal specific or yeah. just opportunities? Um, investment criteria. So deal specific or, and then you can share on opportunities. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll share this. This is one of the, the biggest mistakes I see a lot of people make when they get involved in, in deals is they start by vetting the deal itself. Because they're presented with a pitch deck, they look at the deal, the numbers look great. When have you ever been presented a deal that didn't look good. <laughs> and this mistake people make, they start with the deal, and then what they don't realize is that this GP partnership, they just met each other at a conference at Balboa Bay Resort two weeks ago, <laughs> and are partnering up on this deal for the first time, right? So they get, they get 12 months into the deal, and then mommy and daddy are fighting, the deal, the deal starts going, right? So they spend too much time vetting the deal. So what we really teach and educate our investors on is what we believe really 80% of your vetting process needs to be with the operator. And then you got about 10% in the market and then 10% in the deal itself. And the reason being is because you can have a phenomenal deal with a crappy operations team and they're gonna drive that deal into the ground. But if you have an okay deal with a phenomenal operations team, it's gonna be a home run. And so we really start with the operations and then we work our way down. Now, as far as criteria, goes for operators, we personally, we don't even consider or open a conversation with an operator if at minimum they've been in the business five years and have taken five deals full cycle. And so and like, that's back of napkin, we won't even have a conversation with them. And the reason being is because we don't come in as general partners. As a fund to fund, we come in as a single LP. 
So we really don't have much say legally in that deal. As far as deal criteria goes, we look at anything 100 units and higher, nothing older than 1980s, A and B class. We're the plain, vanilla, boring, safe, secure investment that everybody's looking for right now. So that's really what we push. Awesome. That's great. I feel like I'm just going to be a sounding board for that, but it really does come down to focusing on your partners. That is such a huge part of our diligence. and. You know, sometimes we just have to look back at our deals and say, oh, like, it really has come down to this, this sponsor that we partner, partner with to, to make or break the investment. So that really is probably the biggest piece that we look for as we're evaluating deals uh, is can we make this partnership long term? You know, is this a group that we want to work with and have me personally be bugging for the next three to seven years on K-1s and, you know, different things like that. Is this a group that will deliver? Um, and, and we also make sure that they have a, a significant track record in the industry. So we're typically looking at at least 10 years and a number of full cycle investments and significant knowledge in their operating markets, um, along with the, um, the ability to, to be vertically integrated in, in what they're doing. Um, and from there, yeah, we are certainly evaluating deals, making sure that they're important. Um, Holdfolio, I'd say, is primarily invested in multifamily deals. Uh, that is our uh, kind of our, our background as a sponsor, our expertise. We really understand that department. We love it, and uh, we can certainly spot a good deal uh, when we see one there. But we're pretty opportunistic, so we'll we'll look at a number of deals. We've done, um, we've kind of just started getting into the self storage space. We've done some development deals, hospitality, um, and you know we're always open to investments uh, if if they're good. And kind of echoing um, some of the things that were shared earlier, you know, B class or higher, nineteen eighty or more recent vintage uh, around the US, but yeah, always open for a good deal. Yeah, so pretty similar process to what these guys uh, share, you know, track record, obviously, you know, experience on our side. We look for a minimum of 10 full cycle exits. Uh, we look at a strong partnership team that have been around the block, have gone through up and down cycles. So I'm just gonna share a couple of things about due diligence. Uh, you know, in our case, we absolutely recommend to anyone uh, before you start the partnership, fly out and to see uh, your partner team at their office. Um, have a meal with them, uh, understand their expanded team, meet with the property management. Uh, we, we only work with operators that have fully integrated team. Uh, talk to acquisition person. You will have a much better wipe and understanding who you talk to versus over the Zoom call. Uh, in our case, it usually takes six months, sometimes a year, sometimes more, to come up to terms to understand is this the operator we want to work with. We also absolutely fly to see the asset before we end up investing with it. We want to get a better feel for the neighborhood. We also bring local investors to give us a better understanding what this area is all about. Again, looking at the Google map, you'll have a totally different picture once you actually travel to see the asset. <laughs> and uh, talk to local people. Uh, we get the underwriting uh, from uh, the operator. We cross-check with our internal uh, financial analyst as well to make sure we don't have any gaps or maybe the underwriting is too aggressive, right? And at that point, you know, uh, we have a, a, a founder uh, committee and then we vote to make sure that, yes, this is the deal that we personally like. We also reach out to some times the potential investors as well to make sure they're on board of investing in the deal. And over time, you'll develop a strong relationship, hopefully, with several operators in different markets. In our case, we're expanding into different asset classes as, as well. Uh, but I recommend, uh, you know, everyone, you do not rush building a relationship because you are in that journey with the sponsor for three, five, sometimes even 10 years. So you got to make sure you wet them out. So everyone's doing two questions in one. So I'm gonna just do the same thing. <laughs> so, I mean, everyone knows, you gotta look at the team first, you know, look at the jockey and then look at the horse. So 
I'm gonna answer both those questions. So looking at the team, I think we all know that the past eight to 10 years, people could get lucky in these markets. And so for us looking at teams, it's not so much always how did the deal, you know, how did you exit on it? We're really diving deeper and looking at what is constituting that IRR. You know, did you buy it, really not do anything, and you got lucky and exited? Um, because right now, well, going two years back, moving forward, I think it's gonna really be all about, and what our, you know, our previous speakers were talking about, it's all gonna be about operations. So to me, it's less about, I'm, I'm trying to separate the traders from the true operators. Because the traders made it work with the wind at their back, but momentum's gone, you know, you can't be a trader anymore. So if you're not operationally, um, you know, one of the best people operationally, I just don't think you're gonna, you're gonna last. Um, so speaking to that, um, the other thing that we really look for in a, in a sponsored team is, of course, for ground up development, a little riskier. So we look for 10 years of experience, preferably 10 exits. Um, and I would say a big thing with that as well is since we do a, a deeper dive, um, we are really, we probably go a little deeper than some other folks on the development side. I'll tell you if you, anyone's doing development here or looking into development, just looking at some of the deals that we look at, and these are experienced development groups, I can tell you almost every single time, if it's 200 doors plus, there's probably a million dollars being wasted that can easily be recaptured. So we call that alpha on the project. So we say there's hidden alpha in every single project and everybody's just throwing that away. So we're really looking for the operators that can recognize that alpha and they're really squeezing it and extracting it from these markets or from these projects. So to that extent, what we see, what it takes for people to get to that level, to see what everyone else doesn't see is a level of commitment professionally that sometimes can be wishy-washy in real estate. Um, sometimes you find people who are just getting involved because they're trying to you know, get out of the rat race, is what a lot of people say. And um, for, for myself, you know, I'm, I'm looking to do deals basically forever. I don't ever really want to quit this game. I'm not you know, working to retire or anything like that. So I don't know, how many of you are familiar with Sam Zell? A lot, okay, good. If you haven't heard of Sam Zell, awesome story. He recently passed away. He had an amazing, amazing career. Um, but if you listen to Sam, he did phenomenal because he just loved the game. You know what I mean? He was doing, I'm pretty sure he was in a pretty massive deal the day he died. And personally, that's how I wanna be. So we're looking for operators who wanna be like that too. They're doing it because they really love it. And I don't think you get to the level that we look for unless you really, really love the game, basically. So other than that, we're looking for, you know, typically 75 units plus, uh, major MSAs, we'll look at some tertiary markets. Um, and then really the states we're looking at, Idaho, Utah, uh, Arizona, Texas, Florida, and the Carolinas, which, you know, is nothing really that special. So other than that, that's basically it, and then a bunch of other stuff as well. But if you're, in, you know, if you're kind of fit that category, I'm happy to talk to you more later. So we're very much going to echo a lot of what's been said here as far as it's very much more about the operator first. We have a points-based system, so we actually have a, an approval process that the sponsors can go through prior to any relationship being built. And they can make up points in different areas depending on you know, what they've done in their past. So sometimes it's a new team, but they have experience as operators themselves individually. But we're going to look at everything. We want to look at their operations. We want to look at their, of course, their, their criminal history, if there is any, if there's any of that stuff, uh, any of the bad things. And one really important thing that we look at is their reporting and their communication with their investors. We want to see how often they're reporting and how they're reporting in the good times and the bad times, right? We want to know. In fact, we probably see more in the bad times how they're going to show up um, than in the good times. And so. It's very big for us to focus on the sponsors first, and then we can build from there and look at the, the individual deals themselves. Now, when we're doing the late stage uh, pur purchases of fractional assets, then 
we have a little bit of an upside because we can look at the trailing 12, hopefully, uh, maybe even more, and then we have, we're able to de-risk that invest investment uh, for our investors. And so that's where we can maybe give a little bit more lax on the sponsor side, but we're still gonna be very specific in a lot of things in our CEO. Is there any car guys in the room or gals? Anybody really like cars? He, he gave a great analogy of this where he said, listen, if you could have the best car on the track or you could have the best driver on the track, which would you choose? And the fact of the matter is you wanna have the best driver because the best driver could take probably the worst car and beat everybody on the track. And so that's kind of the way we look at it. Awesome. Okay, so question, when you're meeting with potential partners, walk us through what the timeline for that interview process or approval process looks like. Like let's say you meet somebody a month from now, what does that due diligence period look like for you? So we have a team specifically dedicated to go take people through that approval process. Um, we're using third parties to, to vet them and, and go through that. So we could get it done in a literally uh, one to two weeks. We could go through that full approval process if, and this is the big if we're finding out, they submit all of the things that we ask for as far as their track record and, and whatnot. So when you have some of the bigger players that have half a billion or a billion dollars in assets, they, they have all that stuff ready to go and we can expedite that approval process. We're finding when you have some of the newer sponsors, they don't have all that stuff ready to go or they, they don't have the person dedicated to getting it to us. And so that's, that uh, process can take months. So on the development side, kind of like I was saying earlier, since we go deep dive not only on them, but on their projects, and we're trying to see if there's hidden alpha or if they've found that alpha within their projects, uh, we're gonna be anywhere from six months to potentially a year. I think the difference with us, and for those of you who you know, are thinking very, very long term. Really, we're thinking of partnerships in terms of decades. So we're really not in any rush. And if you're gonna be around for a long time, you're probably not in a rush either. So probably not gonna be in on your first investment you know, within three months. But you know, we're hoping to have a very nice handful of experienced sponsors that we can rely on, that it's a relationship business. And we can do deals and do deals and do deals because we spend so much time doing the upfront work with you that you can kind of count on us and think of us more as a partner as opposed to just transaction just for this one deal. So, we typically start with introduction call. You know, obviously they'll send us uh, their pitch deck and you know, what they're all about, what their criteria, what their track record, and all that. And uh, you know, if things go well, then we have maybe another one or two calls, and we just want to and understand and see if there's a report, you know. Uh, if, if we're asking them for certain information, you know, do they take weeks to respond? Uh, if, if we ask for references, you know, are they hesitant about it or do they openly share that? You know, if, if, if uh, they don't have a deal right now, you know, are they talking to us? Are they replying to us? Uh, and then from that point on, you know, if we decide to move forward, it could be two, three months, sometimes six months, sometimes a year. I mean, in certain cases, it took us two years uh, to start the relationship. You know, we always fly out uh, to meet them in person in their office. And we also try to uh, tour some of their existing assets and compare to some of those reports that they were sharing. And then cross-reference that with the references and investors that invested with, with them. And if things go well, again, it's a process. It's like a dating game. Mm -hmm. You cannot rush this process. Then we proceed to the next step. Yeah, you don't just meet someone at Balboa Bay and hope that you get married next week. Yeah, definitely. That, that's not how it works. Like, no, I mean, that just, that's not how it works for me. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, we're, we're pretty similar. We'll typically have a number of introduc an introductory calls um, and, and just, you know, if it's not the right time, we'll wait it out. We have our pool of sponsors. Uh, we'll kind of check back in with them every now and then to, to see what's going on. Um, but then in addition to that, we have a scorecard that we go through to evaluate our sponsors. We have a number of criteria on that scorecard, um, on their track record, their ability, their, their competencies. And, and, and once they hit you know, at least a 90%, then we really begin to look into the team. We really begin to evaluate the deals that they have going on. 
Um, like was mentioned, communication is a major part of our diligence, and so it is typically pretty clear within the first you know, couple conversations or follow-up emails that they're not able to provide clear, transparent, candid responses. These are probably people we don't want to work with later on. So, you know, very active, clear communicators are important. And then after we have, um, uh, you know, evaluated them, we like a, um, a sponsor, we typically ask that they join us for, we call them executive debriefs or essentially a webinar for our investors. And so that also gives our, our investors the opportunity to see these sponsors, to hear them talk, talk about their project. You know, not all of our investors really get the opportunity to have a lot of interaction with our sponsors. So we make sure that that's something that our sponsors are, are you know, willing to do and, and want to do, uh, kind of represent their side for our investors. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I just, yeah. I can go off on tangents, so I just want to make sure <laughs> I'm speaking to the question. <laughs> yeah, um, I believe this one, this one was, uh, no, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was how we what's, your, what's your due diligence process? Due diligence process, okay. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm, so, and the, and the time frame. So the partners we partnered up with so far, I've known for probably 24 months or greater because I've met them at events like this and I've watched them over the last couple of years to see how they really operate. Um, so not to say that that would be the case for everyone because as we dial in our systems and we get more comfortable, we're gonna be able to vet those people much, much quicker. Now, at the point we initiate the conversation of, hey, could this be a partnership? I'd say two to three months is typically our process. But again, we've everyone we partnered up with so far, we've known for quite some time. We've seen what they've been doing. I love social media. I absolutely love social media. So some of you I've already met here. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna stalk you on social media. And if you have pictures <laughs> with you and the boys in Vegas, I might question that potential partnership, right? There's just certain things that, that we look for. Now, we have a essentially a three-phase process. First, it's just a, an application. If you're not even going to take the time to give us some basic information about your company, we're not going to continue on to further intro calls. Then we have the calls, and then we finish with a, an on-site visit. And I love what Alex shared. We won't get into a deal unless we have boots on the ground walking that deal. And, uh, and this is huge. Like we, we just closed on 382 units in San Antonio a couple weeks ago with a partner. And we vetted them and probably, it was probably about a month, but I knew of them through our network. And this is the thing, like when you're in real estate, especially and multifamily, it's actually a pretty tight group. Like you're probably one or two degrees away of separation from that person. So just a few questions, just asking around, you're probably gonna find out information about that operator. We also really look for, we prefer people that are vertically integrated. This group we just partnered with, they had their construction team in-house and their property management in-house. So they were able to operate a lot more lean and that's that's important, that's important to us. Um, so yeah. Great, okay, uh, tell us about some of the red flags that you notice when you're evaluating a partner. Um, Fortunately, we haven't experienced any like red flags yet with anyone that we've uh, operated because I, maybe it's the, the before we even have a conversation, we've kind of already vetted them. Questions that I encourage, that we ask everyone, and whether you're a fund to fund or just an investor, three questions that we're asking every potential partner right now is have you ever performed a capital call? And that's not a deal breaker for us because there's a lot of unprecedented events these past couple years that triggered some people to have to do capital calls. But what it tells us is, were you a little too aggressive when times were good? And then when things took a turn, now you're coming back to your investor. So that's one of the questions, have you ever performed a, a capital call and do you have any expectations to? And none of our partners that we've partnered up with so far have. So that says a lot to us about how they operate and the reserves they keep on hand. Number two, one of my questions is, what do you know about this deal that I don't know that I should probably know? And when you ask a question like that, you'll be amazed at what they might come back with. 
Uh, so there's that one, and there's another one, but I forgot it, so uh, I'm sure it'll come back to me. You can tell us on the boat when you remember. All right, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a number of red flags that we may see when we're evaluating, you know, I, I think after the partnership has been made, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to get out of that. So hopefully no red flags past the, the partnership. But as we're evaluating these companies, um, uh, usually a limited track record and a very aggressive mindset with that, that limited track record. You know, if there's a group and they just started last year, they're you know, maybe no additional operating experience, and they're promising just very, very high IRRs, really high cash returns, you know, within the first couple years, that's probably the biggest red flag, you know, it just, they have nothing to, to base those claims on. So, you know, are they conservative, um, conservative estimators? Do they have a good track record, good communicators? Um, if they're not meeting that criteria, those are probably things to look for. Uh, so if I can add a couple more things, uh, you know, uh, if an operator has been around for a while and they don't have a deal that has gone sour, you got to wonder <laughs> how long they've been in business. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, real estate is cyclical and if you're not seeing that and you want to dig deeper and asking them what, what has gone wrong, that's one. Second thing is, in our case, uh, we actually run background checks on the founders of the company and uh, we ask them, if we run background check on you, should we be surprised? And, uh, you know, I, I cannot emphasize this enough, but everybody must do that. Especially if you're work, you know, going to plan working with an operator for a long time, you don't want to find out later that the guy was in jail one year ago. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, the, the last thing is uh, about the skin in the game. I mean, we turned down a couple of deals as well where when we asked them that question, they were kind of elusive. They didn't say how much they're interested in this and that. You know, we want to see that if you really like the deal, at least put in 5 to 10% of the capital that is required. And if that's not the case, we're probably going to walk away from the deal. Uh, so there's a lot of red flags. Um, so just starting with the sponsor themselves, of course, we do a quantitative and qualitative analysis. So, you know, of course, background checks, everything like that. Um, just on that, you know, anything comes up with criminal record or anything like that. Talking to uh, references of investors, something else we would do on the development side is talking actually to trade partners. Um, a lot of the firms that we're looking at or talking with or some of the ones that we've kind of committed with are vertically integrated. So, you know, we can look them up on, you know, kind of general contracting credit score type of um, software to see, you know, how are they playing within the space? Do they have a bunch of people haven't been paid? Do people like working with them? Um, that's, I would say that's another huge red flags is kind of no jerks policy. If we want to build a long-term relationship with this person, uh, we don't, I guess we, we don't want to work with someone who, you know, you wouldn't want to hang out with type of thing, um, since we're planning on investing with them for hopefully decades. Um, so moving on from that, looking at the deal itself, uh, on the development side, there's a, I would say there's about three to four items on the development construction side that seems to be overlooked a lot. If we see that, then that's going to make us dive deeper, and then if we see more, it's a little, even a little more concerning. Um, looking at things like how aggressive is the how aggressive or realistic is their construction schedule, um, contingencies, and then of course on the financing side, how are their sensitivity studies? There's a there's three metrics that we really look at that we don't really talk about. Um, that if they can't be two to three standard deviations, move on that, and they don't realize that that it would end up blowing them up then that's something that you know, would be concerning to us. But again, since we've been working, since we're focused on people who've been around for a while, um, a lot of times they, you know, they know this kind of stuff. And then you know, what was mentioned before, what's been your worst deal, basically? You know, and how do you, how do you handle that? Because everyone's gonna have a bad deal. It's not if you have a bad deal, it's when. And really, how are you gonna, how do you gonna, you know, work your way through that? So. 
So I think one of the biggest red flags that we've seen is they really need that money right now, and they continue to they continue to send us the deal even though they haven't sent us the information that we've asked for. Big red flag. <laughs> can uh, take them out of getting approved ever with us potentially. I mean, I, I never want to use the word ever, but um, we've seen a few of those that have come across where they really need that money, and one of them went as far as to tell. And I didn't do this call, but our CEO that he was so glad he was going to be getting this money so he could pay his bills, right? So that's <laughs> big, big red flag to watch out for there. Um, somebody we were, we were planning to, on working with. The other thing that I would say is if they're really good at selling the deal and the returns, and they have maybe even sometimes unrealistic, unrealistic projections, but they don't have a lot of concentration on their operations. If they can't really go into detail on how their operations are going to work effectively and that they go above and beyond in making sure that they have the right team members to fulfill those operations, that's a big red flag for us because I think that, uh, I think it's already been mentioned, we've been in this market where there were traders that could get into the market but weren't really executors, right? And some of them made money and you know did very well for their investors and they may be representing themselves as good operators, but the operations is the biggest aspect of the deal. Sure. Okay. And um, how much capital do you typically provide in any given transaction? And how often, or what's the frequency of the clip that you're looking at deploying that capital? So this one's going to be, again, a little probably different from our scenario. We're buying those fractional interests from the LPs. Yep. Those are going to be smaller amounts, most likely somewhere between one hundred dollars to $250,000, maybe up from there. Uh, on the pref equity side, we're typically, we don't want to be more than about 5% of the overall deal itself. So that kind of gives you an idea. We may be $500,000 to a million dollars on a pref equity situation. What's also different with ours is we are short cycle with what we're doing so we're big on promoting these sponsor themselves so we will actually help them back fill out our expensive money with less expensive money through our media and the things that we do that way um, so if we can see the potential to get that money back faster we may be willing to deploy more so for us it's at a minimum um, half a million up to potentially 2.5, uh, we're looking to start deploying in Q1 of next year. Uh, we already have one group basically with a soft commitment and we're hoping to deploy about $10 million within uh, a year and a half from starting in Q1. Uh, our typical check size is between two and five million. Uh, we've done more than five uh, in the past. Uh, historically, we've done one, sometimes two deals a quarter, but we're not desperate. So we are looking for the right deal, and if the deal doesn't come along in a quarter, we're just gonna skip it. Uh, it's all about making the right, wise decisions. We are typically looking to raise anywhere as low as 500,000 up to $2 million at a time. Uh, we like to do about one to two deals a month. So you know, typically if, if we're trying to do two deals a month, we'll be raising a lower amount, but um, one thing that our, our sponsors do and, and the partners that we work with do really like about us is that when we make a commitment, we are able to, to stick to that amount. So we'll typically actually uh, commit a lower amount to a sponsor. Um, and then it's very common for us the first or second day to completely fill that amount. And then we'll usually go back and, and ask for a little bit more space. Um, but yeah, typically around 12 to 15 deals a year. We'll place one to two million, and our goal is to do two to three a quarter. Um, and it, it really depends too on, on just the deal and, and the operator, because being in a fund to fund position, I, mean, I think this is why we're all in it. We don't ever have to go out and look for a deal again, because you guys are going to be coming to us with the opportunities, and we spend our time building the relationships with the capital. So, and we won't make a commitment unless we've got those funds either pending or in our account. And so when we make a commitment with operators, we're ready to go. And we, we tell operators, the question we get a lot is like, so do I, do I invest now? When does that money get deployed? Or do you take 10% and then when a deal comes up, you do a capital call. And by the way, in that scenario I just shared, that's not the capital call I was referring to earlier, just so we're clear. 
um, and we tell our investors we want it now because if we tell this operator we've got two million we're gonna put into your deal because you told us that you were ready to go how many people here have gone people have told you like yeah I'll put money into that deal I'll put a hundred thousand in and you go to them at the time of the deal and they're like oh sorry something came up who's experienced that yeah. a lot of us have right we don't want that reputation with our operators and so we tell them that, and we tell our investors, this is the situation. We're not going to commit to a deal until we know we've got your money because it makes us look bad. And, uh, and then we tell our investors, we don't, our goal is to not hang on to your money for more than 30 days because we got to get that money working. Um, so that with our current situation, given the one, two million per deal puts us at about two to three deals a quarter is what we're targeting. Awesome. Well, what I'd like to do now is open it up to questions. So if you have a question for the panel, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm going to sneak by over here so you get a microphone. Okay, anybody have a question? Bueller, Bueller. Okay. I was just curious, gentlemen, if you guys, and yeah, ladies, excuse me, uh, if you could talk about uh, you know, your structure in terms of fees and so forth, and also what kind of uh, promotes and, and uh, preferred are expected from uh, your investors. How do you want to address that? Because that can, we could spend between all of us probably 20 minutes talking about that. Um, we have three minutes for questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a I, one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be more appropriate. Yeah. Connect with us outside, I think that would yeah, be Yeah, I think maybe connect on the yacht, go meet all five We've of these got people. media out there, so. Yeah. You, you got one in the background. Yep. So after you go through the vetting process and you have your list of sponsors, how much time do you guys need when a deal is presented to you before you can commit and say, we've vetted it, we've gone through the underwriting and we're comfortable doing this deal? For us, we try to keep that to about two weeks. And the reason being is because when deals are presented to us, they, they typically it's at the time of PSA signing. Now we try to find out about that deal before the LOI is even submitted. And then we ask for the financials because we, we underwrite that, end of, we don't even look at that operator's underwriting. We ask them for the financials and the OM and we independently underwrite it with our underwriting team. And then we compare it to their underwriting. And that brings up questions and then we get on a call with them. So we try to keep it to two weeks so that they know that it's committed. But really, again, it's up to them. If they're not communicating or responding and getting us the information we need, it's gonna take longer. Great. Okay. How big is your team? Hang on one second. Oh. How big is your team? We have four. Um, we have four, we have Jacob uh, and TJ kind of leading up at the front, myself um, on investor relations, and then we have our my colleague, Neil Lindsay, on the underwriting and, and tax and accounting. But I'm sure it varies. Go that way, go that way. Right, we always, uh, so in our case, it's me and my co-founders, and then we've got a lot of outsourcing people, you know, marketing, accounting, social media, taxes, legal, you name it. Uh, so back to that gentleman's question. Mm -hmm. So for us, if, if, you know, what we're anticipating just based on our conversations right now is if we have an established relationship with you, we know how you do things, how you like to build things, it's gonna be a faster process. I'm anticipating typically probably 30 days, but if we're well established, it's probably gonna be closer to two to three weeks. <laughs> Um, as far as team size, it's going to be myself and five other real estate professionals. And I will echo, if, you, if we have the information up front, our goal is you get approved with us first and you send us the deal the same way you're sending it out to your uh, LP investors. And then if you need us, then we've already done some of that underwriting and given you uh, that offer letter. So uh, as far as our team, I believe there's about 14 of us total. Nine of those are partners uh, within the firm and then we have some outside employees. For the gentleman from Ukraine, uh, do you see the as the 
hopefully the war wraps up soon and that type of thing. Is there going to be big opportunities for the rebuild of Ukraine and some fund investment opportunities there? I wish I had a crystal ball or any spy information that I can release. <laughs> but I just signed NDA because I knew this question was coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Let's give everyone on our panel a round of applause. Woo!